All right. So Philippians 3, verses 3 through 9. I'm going to read from the King James Version. And it reads, But we are the circumcision, which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, are Hebrews of the Hebrew, as touching the law, a Pharisee concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. And do count them but done, that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. And if you journey with me for just a few minutes, I want to embark down the theme, the value of a name. The value of a name. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you on today for all that has transpired, for what you're about to do through your words. And Father God, even for the seeds that will produce fruit in your timing. We thank you, Father God, for every testimony shared, for every song that has gone forth, for even the praise dancers ministering unto you, Father God, saying that you are intentional. You are purposeful on all the steps that you take. You are purposeful for what you have assigned for our life. You wrote a book about our lives before you dispatched us, Father God. So, God, we thank you, Lord, that you are very intentional and purposeful with every action that goes forth. Now, God, I ask you, Father God, to be that same have that same purpose with the words that you allowed me to speak on today. I decrease so you may increase in the name of Jesus. Allow for nothing to be shared unless you deem it fit and needing for your people on today in the name of Jesus. I bind up any thoughts that's going through our minds that are counter your spirit in this time in the name of Jesus. I bind up the ancient spirits right now in the name of Jesus that are trying to cause for us to focus upon time when you have called us to use this time to focus upon you. Father God, we're putting the main thing main once again in the name of Jesus. And we thank you, Father God, that we are more than enough in the season that we're in. Now, Father God, do what must be done. Satan, you are rendered helpless and obstinate and effective against our God and the word of God that we speak. There is nothing you can do to touch us because our God stands before you. And the Bible says that when we invoke the name Jesus, demons must flee, and that includes you. So you are now welcome in this place. We shut every door that the enemy thinks he has access to right now in the name of Jesus. Father God, have your way. Do what, do what must be done. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Now, can we give God some praise right now? <laughs> now, over the past few weeks, God has taken us into a series about faith. It has caused us to spend a lot of our time talking about the faith factor. He has used our theme scripture, 2 Corinthians 5 and 7, to keep in the front of our mind that we are to be faithful in this particular season. Now, recognize this is the same theme that we had last year. So realize that this season is a little bit elongated, but the fruit that's going to be manifested won't be able to be touched by the enemy. We are to be full of faith and have an understanding that our faith is a major factor within this season. The amount of faith that we have is more than enough for our current battle. And here's the funny thing, and that we are to use the current battles to build up the faith necessary for the battles to come, even though we know that we are already run the war because we have chosen God over the enemy, over our problems, over our shortcomings, over our past, over the depression, over the past hurt, over the failures, over all that tries to overtake the position that is firmly God's. 
So do not be afraid. If you're wondering why you're going through this certain battle or trial or tribulation, it's because, number one, your faith is enough to overcome it right now. But God is a God of provision. He's already providing you the faith necessary to be able to defeat the next battle that is to come into your life. Because God doesn't, God is a now God, but he, like I said earlier, he wrote a book about our life before he dispatched us. So he understands the cost and the amount of faith we're going to need for what's on the other side of the mountain that we're going up right now. Amen? Amen. So if we begin to look into the scripture, Philippians 3, starting at verse 3, we notice that Paul's starting to talk to the church in Philippi. Now, what you have to remember is that Paul is not there in the city or at that church. He's actually locked up in jail. They won't let him out in Rome. This is one of the prison letters that is presented to us for Paul. And we also have to understand that this is 10 years after this particular church saw something miraculous happen. This was the church, this was the city that saw the jail doors and chains fall in Acts 16 verses 12 through 40 at midnight. Or, as we know, suddenly. This is the suddenly city. city. You know, the, the one we talk about, and then at midnight, suddenly the chains fell off the people. The doors began to open. The jailers had to repent because he saw the two men in there praising and worshiping God, even though they were shackled by their chains and they were shackled by their arms. The enemy could not shackle their voice, and they was praising and worshiping regardless of who was around and that all the other prisoners in there had to hear the word of God manifest and see the foundation shaking. This is the city that we're talking about right now. He's sending a letter to this church. So he's able to encourage, motivate, and bring some correction where it's needed. Because, I mean, Paul is an apostle. And that's what apostles do. They are the sent ones. They begin to bring reformation where it's needed based on the word of God in the kingdom of heaven. Now, how it's done is based on the skills God has given them. You'll see where that comes up later on. Later on. Amen? Amen. So Philippians 3 and 3, it says, For we are the circumcision which... Worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. In other words, what Paul is doing, he's reminding the church of Philippi who they are. And he's also stating who they are not in the midst of that statement. If you go back and you read the book of Romans, what you will notice is that Paul outlines that there is a battle between the spirit and the flesh. They do not like each other because they serve two different masters. And so where we come into play is the thing that we feed is going to grow. The thing that we starve dies off. So even though those two items, the spirit and the flesh, are in a battle, we decide who the winner is. Because Matthew 6, 24 tells us you cannot serve two masters. So we are the deciding factor on who wins. And what we have to understand is that this also is attached to who we are. Now, during men's ministry on yesterday, the main speaker talked about questions that men should be asking themselves during different seasons of their lives. He stated that during a certain period of time, men should be asking God who they are and who they are not. And it, it was exciting me because I thought about James 1 and 5 in the Amplified Version. It says, if any of you lacks wisdom to guide him through a decision or circumstance, circumstance, he is to ask of our beloved God who gives to everyone generously and without rebuke or blame, and it will be given unto him. That includes who you are. One of the major things understanding in this season is who you, who you are because that's one of the number one things the enemy will try to tell you to your face. I see some of you wavering, so let me tie this in. In the movie Black Panther, which I've seen three times already, and may see for a fourth time, depending on if the rental time is up by the time I get home, the question of identity appears with various characters. Now, the one character that pops up to me, which I think a lot of people overlook, is the character Eric Steven, or Eric Killmonger. See, now, let me pause. If you have not seen Black Panther, I'm about to give you a spoiler. So you might want to close your ear for about the next 60 seconds if you don't want to hear this part. Okay? Just letting you know. So now. <laughs> All right. So Eric ends up in Wakanda in front of King T'Challa and the other elders. 
He tells them what his plan was, and they laughed at him. See, his plan was to um, assume the throne, to be the king of Wakanda. Now, in the midst of all of this, he wasn't moved by their reaction because he understood who he was. He understood the right he carried, even though the people around him did not understand who he really was. Even to the point where the king came in charge of him, and he told the king, ask me who I am. He was that bold that he said, ask me who I am. And the king was like, I don't even care, and turned his back and walked away. Even when they said, and someone else described, well, who are you? His little sister, the princess, came up and said, he's Eric Stephen. He has this, and da-da-da-da-da, and da-da-da-da-da. And he was like, you got it wrong, princess. To the point where the princess was like, well, what are you talking about? The king was like, I don't care what your name is. The one of the elders said, who are you? They invited him to say who he was. And he spoke in their native language and began to say that this is my name. And I'm the prince of another prince in your kingdom. Which means I'm invoking my royal, my royal characteristics and royal rights in this atmosphere. To where it shocked everyone's face. Because they did not know who he was, but he knew who he was. How could that be if he's never been to Wakanda? You want to know how? Why? How he knew that? His father told him who he was. His father made sure to tell him, this is your name here, but that's not your real name. I've given you... I've given you a key to get you back to the kingdom you're supposed to be in that people won't be able to identify to the point where when you show it to them, then they will know who you are and your access and rights will begin given unto you quickly because then he said, I challenge for the throne and the king had to decide yes or no. He can no longer be thrown away by queen mother who he said, hi, auntie. He begins to say who he was. And it invoked rights that was given unto him. People of God, we have to understand in this season, we cannot lose who we are. We too are a royal priesthood. We have access to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We are king's kids. We have angels waiting for us to tell them to do something. We have power and authority because our Father in heaven has given us power and authority and access to the resources of the king, of the kingdom. So we need to know who we are and begin to move as such. It is awesome that you know who you are, but the question, are you acting like that? Are you acting below the standard your father has given you? Now, in the same thing, we also have to know in realizing who we are that we identify who we ain't. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Sorry. It allows us to know who we are not. I'm sorry. Every time, time I text a draw comes out, I apologize. I'm sorry about that. But what I'm saying for us and what God has shown me is that it's time for us to get our identification cards, our ID cards from God and display it to the enemy every time he has the audacity to tell us who we are. When it comes up with you are worthless, you need to show him Psalms 139 and say, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. When it comes up with you will never succeed, show him Philippians 4 and 13 which says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. When it comes up with it has always been like that in your family, you need to let him know that new things are springing forth. Do you not see it. Be bold enough against the enemy to tell him to back off of me because you are not my daddy. <laughs> Begin to embrace your identity in this season. Amen? The second thing, we have to be able to recognize as we turn to the, the text, we have to recognize that we have to exchange our past for our future. Okay, let me say it again. We have to recognize that we have to change our past for our future. Well, what do you mean? What do you mean? Paul starts in verse 4 starting to share his story. You know that whole part when he started getting cocky talking about, is anyone as confident in the flesh? <laughs> I'm more. In other words, if anyone's going to say they're confident in the flesh, huh, I can trump that. Because he starts to say who his earthly things were, his earthly accomplishments. He said, I was born in this tribe. I've done what the law said. I did this task. I accomplished this goal. I've gotten this requirement. I've gotten the praise. In other words, he was saying, I was the man in a sense. When you go back and read Acts 7, you'll notice that it is 
Paul, I'm going to get to in a moment, Paul, who's ordering Stephen to die. You know, Stephen, the deacon that was there, it was Paul ordering it, but he wasn't Paul then. He was Saul, not King Saul from the Old Testament, because, I mean, that would be old. He was Saul at that time. And so he was saying, I was persecuting the church. I was doing all of these things until I had an interaction with Christ on the road to Damascus. That caused for me to be blind. I got interaction with the spirit of God because I had the law, but I didn't have the spirit to smack me in the head. And in the midst of it, what happened is that his name was changed from Saul to Paul. He had to exchange the past name to receive the new name from Christ. And so verse 7 kind of tells us that it said, but whatever former things were gained to me as I thought then, these things once regarded as advancement in merit, I have come to consider as lost absolutely worthless to the sake, for the sake of Christ and the purpose which he has given unto me. So in other words, what he's saying is, all the things I accomplished before, you can just go ahead and just kick those in the trash can because it doesn't outweigh my relationship with Christ. It doesn't outweigh what my future is going to be ahead of me. Now, a few years ago, I needed to order a birth certificate because, you know, parents lose stuff, which is okay. I love them still. But I found something interesting out about my birth certificate and my name. The name that I've been called my entire life, the name that I was taught is not actually my legal name. There was something missing in my name. My legal name is O.C. Lee Jr. Lowry III. Okay, you didn't catch it. Let me help you. My father's suffix is a part of my legal name. So not only do I carry my family's last name, not only do I carry my family's like top boy's name, I specifically carry my father's name in my name. And what it did is unlock that it now explains why I'm so passionate about legacy. It unlocks why I'm so, I want to honor him with all that I have. It's not just because he was a great father. It's not just because he set a, a, a great atmosphere for me. It's not the fact that I saw him stand up in a time in which he could have fell down. It's the fact that his legacy is attached to my legacy because I literally carry his name. But for me to understand that, I had to go back to the root and find what was my name called. Some people would think this is just a mere mistake because me being who I am waited two days later to be born and that my mother had to name me because I got my father's 1983 Toyota Corolla towed from the hospital so he was asleep when I was born and my mother wasn't sure if they were trying to ask for my father's name or my name, but I see that it was the work of God to say that this boy who was the fourth person going through a pregnancy, the other three was a miscarriage, you'll get that in a moment, fourth, supernatural, that this boy will carry on the family name and be the only one to be able to do so as our only child. That's what our God does. He doesn't make mistakes, but it took me to go back and to look and see what is my legal name. For some of us, we never ask God, who am I, and ask what the name is to be able to declare to people, this is what God has called me. Not just the characteristics of God, but exactly what I am. Because we recite clearly when God told Moses, when Moses asked God, what do I say to people? He said, I am that I am. But if we're sons of the most living God, if we are children of the most high God, then when people ask us who we are, we should still have the same boldness to say, I am and fill in the blame for what God has said that we are. So if we have the ability to speak things in existence, we have the same ability to tell people who we really are. Once again, Killmonger, as soon as someone said, who, who are you, he routed off because he'd been thinking about it for so long. This exact moment. Didn't know how to get there, but he got there. So for us, we have to remember and keep in mind who we are and be able to look back and see 
who we really are because what it ends up doing is start breaking down the walls of what people has layered over of us. Remember I said, I did not know that was my legal name. And so now I have a tool to say, what you call me is not who I really am. This is my real name. This is what I go by. So let me help you here. When people try to tell you who you are, First of all, without having an attitude, begin to tell them, you ain't living my life, so you really don't know who I am. You only thinking who you you only think who you think that I am, and that is not who I am. Now you don't gotta snap your neck and do your finger. You don't gotta do all this. But what I'm saying is, don't come at them like that unless they keep poking at you. Then you're like, okay, look here. But what I am saying is this: don't accept what people give you. Don't accept what people give you. Exchange your past for your future. Because as soon as you get that name and you understand who you really are, then their future is what you end up focusing on. Remember, Paul counted all the things before done for the glory of God. My last point is this. Our words of faith must be met with actions of faith. Our words of faith must be met with actions of faith. How do you want me to explain this guy? Okay. People will hear the words that you say, but only remember the actions that you do. People are, as humans, we are good saying the thing that we need to say to get what we want. But it is the actions that begin to really say are we really about that life. And when we talk about expressing faith, because we're in the, the faith series, we're in the midst of a season about faith. What we have to understand is it is good that we talk, but like God keeps bringing us back to 2 Corinthians 5 and 7, what is your walk? Are you walking in faith? Are you walking in the faith you proclaim for others? Are you walking in the faith that you pray about? Are you moving in the faith that you are saying that you have? And one of the toughest moments that we have in faith is when we make the exchange. So, Pastor Vince, I'm going to call you up here real quick, and I need you for this demonstration, and then I'll be done for today. Amen? Look at that. See, quick, easy. Not bad. Okay, I want you to stand up here. All right. So, okay, so I want you to hold this. So, demonstration, okay? We express words of faith, especially to God. We say, God, this is what it is, what have you, what have you. And we pray, we repent, all those things. So what ends up happening, especially when we're praying and declaring things to God and giving things to God, or especially when we talk about our kids, Lord, I give my kids, my kids unto you. Here's what happened. So for illustration purposes, okay, past events, okay, it's praying. I am going to play the role of God for illustration purposes. Amen? Okay. Here's what happened. So Pastor Vince is praying, a whole bunch of things, laboring, hope you don't break the box. Kind of strong. But when he's praying, what he's doing or what he's, what he's trying to do is give what his prayer is, which is the box, up to God. Okay? So when you're done praying, yep, all that stuff, yep. So what happens is, because I'm not that tall, not yet, praise God, he gives the box up. Now, rule number one. Part number one, for some people, hold the box. Some people don't know how to give up the box to God. Okay, so step number one, okay. So let's, so pass that hurdle, so he lets it go, give it to God. Hold your hands up, okay. Do you notice anything in his hand? No. What, is, what God showed me is that for us as people of God, our hands are up, we give it unto him. But the question is, we put them quickly down, not realizing that the weight of holding our hands open is the strength that God is trying to build inside of us. Because one of the hardest things for people to do is to be empty-handed. And in the midst of an exchange, in the midst of talking about our word of faith, there's a moment in time in which there's absolutely nothing in our hand. And this is the moment where fears try to creep in. Oh, come on now. Y'all been at grocery stores and been in the line, been looking at the cashier like, will they please hurry up? This person really got to write a check right now. Don't they have debit cards? Don't they know they can use PayPal and swipe it? Come on now. Or be in the movie theater. Keep your hand up. I'm proving point. So... 
be in the movie theater and be like, man, can they just hurry up and get that popcorn? I'm about to be late for these previews because anticipation is something that's lost on us. Not realizing we've already paid the cost necessary to be in the grocery line. We already have the things that we're going to go for. We know we have the funds necessary to pay for it. We've already paid the movie ticket price. We're going, we have a guaranteed seat in the theater, but it's being impatient that tends to get us because we want to know, God, do it now, do it now, do it now. And God's like, no, I need your hands open for a season because what I'm preparing you for is going to be bigger than what you gave me. But I need you to prepare for the weight of it. See, when you work out, you work out for more weight to come upon you. You don't just work out to maintain. You work out to gain strength. And when you gain strength, it's because something you're trying to attack is stronger than where you are at now. But this is when God said, I'm going to come inside of you, give you the strength necessary to be able to handle what's there. That's why he says, my grace is sufficient, which means it doesn't matter what weight's coming to you. It doesn't matter what's there. What ends up happening is the thing you gave me is going to be sm- the thing you gave me and comparing what I have your name on. But I need to, while you have your hands empty, to break the stronghold that's on your life that's going to block you from truly waiting to receive the gift. I need to begin to destroy the myths that's around your life and the myths about me so that you're able to receive that's what comes to you. And what happened is while your hand is in the air empty-handed, God said, I'm building the faith necessary for what I'm going to give you so that when I give it to you, you know what to do with it. You can move seamlessly. I've already cleared the way for you. You can just walk into it. You can have a seat. Thank you. And so the hardest things exchanging our past for our future because fear wants to creep in. But what God is saying is this. God is saying for us, we're in the midst of the exchange season. There are things that are being exchanged because God is calling us to grow up. See, when you read 1 Corinthians 13 and you go past the love scriptures, what you notice in verse 11 that he says, there's a time in which you have to give up childish things so that you can mature. But sometimes we interpret, well, it's my youth, it's these items. No, sometimes the things you have to give up are old tools that will not work in your new season. If I need to dig something, I'm not going to grab my son's uh, uh, bucket and shovel. I'm going to get a real shovel that's my size. I'm going to go get a real wheelbarrow that works for the weight that's task that I'm trying to accomplish. But for some of us, we're trying to use kid toys on an adult problem. Oh, and let me help you for my theologians. Yes, I understand Matthew 18 says, you come to him with childlike faith. I understand that. But at some point, the faith got to grow, doesn't it? At some point, it has to fit the side that you're in because it says, I thought in Hebrews 6, that eventually you got to stop drinking spiritual milk and get on these meat. So there's a transformation. There's an exchange. There's a maturity that has to happen. And guess what? We're all going through it. We may not talk about it, but God will not have me go through all these multiple things, having the fast pay, past failure, and for him to say, I'm now maturing you because now you're ready to not go through the hurdle, not go under the hurdle, but to walk over the hurdle. Amen. But it's going to take the words of faith becoming the action of faith. And so at the end of the main scripture, and I'm done, you can stand to your feet at this time. What you'll notice at the end of the of the, the rest of the main scripture from verse 8 and verse 9, Paul continued to praise God and talked about his transformation. But with the church of Philippi, what's interesting is that it's one of the rare churches that Paul really didn't have to do too much correction. There were some things going on, but his letter was really a letter of encouragement. And so to conclude on today, I just want to encourage you as new beginnings discipleship ministries Des Moines because eventually we're going to get used to that title new beginnings discipleship ministries Des Moines okay let me let let me clear let me make sure you understand what you just proclaimed this is only round one 
there's multiple rounds coming. I didn't say just one other. There are multiple rounds coming. So we have to prepare for that. Some of us will go out and begin to head those other places. Others of us will stay and make sure home base is taken care of. But what it's going to take is the faith to be prepared for when we have to go out. To where? I don't know. He never told Abraham where to stop. He just told Abraham to go. It's interesting. Matthew 28 tells us first to go. Doesn't tell you where. It says go. And so it's going to take that faith necessary to move with God, not stay at the last movement of God in this season. Because guess what? Don't let the fear of the spot you occupy being open stop you from moving into the position God has crafted for you in this next season. Because guess what? Someone had to let God be God for you to be in the position you're in now. Now it's your turn. Now it's your turn. Amen? Amen. Amen. Give God some praise on today. Yeah. So on today, if this message encouraged you, spoke to you, and it caused you to look at your life, and you recognize you've been misidentified by the world, but you're not sure what your ID card should say because you never ask God, what is my spiritual ID? What is my role in the kingdom of heaven? What is the goal that you have for me? What am I to do with the talents you've given me? Because as much as God changed Saul's name to Paul and he gave him the spirit, God still used the tools in the history Paul had as Saul to advance the kingdom of God. As much as we make the exchange, God's still saying, I'm going to take what was meant for your bad or that you use improperly to be used for the kingdom of God. So if that is you, we open the altar so that we may pray with you, we may touch and agree with you. I'm looking around, see everyone's faces. I believe everyone here has given their life to Christ, but if you have not, we open the altar for you as well. If there's anyone who wants to rededicate their life to Christ, we open the altar for you as well. Because see, understand, just like Saul, who turned to Paul, God is willing to have that interaction with you as well to show you who you really are. If New Beginnings, Discipleship Ministries, Des Moines is the church God calling to be affiliated with, we welcome you. This is who we are. This is how we act. We laugh. We hug. We do all these things. But at the same time, we're serious about the things of God. We're so serious about the things of God. We don't play around with God's word. So if that's what God's calling you to plant here, we open our doors to you as well. And we say give all to God. We're here to just help you build a personal relationship with Christ. And if there's any other prayer requests at this time, we open the altar for you as well. I'm going to go ahead and give the benediction. Heavenly Father, we thank you on today for all that you have done, for all that you just have planned for our lives and showing us, Father God, the need that there is a value in the name. There is a value in knowing who we are. There's a value even knowing what your name means and the the access that we have, the things that's able to destroy, the things that's able to dismantle, the things that's able to change, Father God. But it requires for us to believe in it and to put our full faith in it, God. God, I thank you for what you're going to do with us and for us as a body of believers. And we know, Father God, that the the harvest is coming in. Father God, it's no coincidence that you would choose today as Pentecost with Shavuot, the feast of the ingathering, to talk about preparing for us to bring in and being prepared for the influx that will come. Now, God, I ask you, Father God, to just continue to speak to your people's heart, allow for them to begin to continue to manifest and to turn over the words that were shared on today. And, Father God, we just continue to thank you and love you and praise you. We just, we're just in awe of what you are and who you are and what you do. And so we'll give you the glory and honor and praise always. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.